difficult to say. He did exploit the culture of the old ones. And he picked up on both our culture as a romantic one within the broader social, political, and economic history of the region and focused on some sensational parts of his own life. Some folklorists have praised Randolph for using exact methods and high standards. Other folklorists aren't so content with making the methods feel good. For example, Ellen Deckert, in a review of Pissing in the Snow, enumerates her problems with Randolph's methods. She said, I have always had two problems with Randolph's words. One, he wrote most of his collected materials from memory after the performance situation was passed. And two, in the majority of cases, he was the sole collector, recorder, and editor who observed and filtered the data. It is difficult for an individual not to leave some mark upon the materials he or she collects. In the absence, and in the absence of such objectifying technology as recording devices, the problem is intensified. Consequently, I have always had difficulty determining in his books where Randolph leaves off and where the old art people begin. Where Randolph leaves off and where the Ozark people begin, it could be argued, is clear in the hundreds of photographs he took in the Ozarks in the 1920s and 1940s. His photographs are in the documentary tradition. He said he shot his photographs for illustrations. As such, they might be viewed as chemical, mechanical reproductions of reality. Randolph, in essence, objectified the Ozark people on photographic film. Nevertheless, Randolph, <clears throat> Randolph's eye and will, his creative view, was behind the lens of church. In that sense, Randolph's photographs should be looked on as subjective creations. Most of the pictures he took are fairly honest portrait portraits of the people he knew and met in the room. He owned others, however. And most of these depicted artifacts either as the main subject or props in the romantically conceived vignette of Mozart's life. One set of photographs, which is exhibited here, features a moonshine still. She had a symbol in his backyard. Uh, the photographs he took of Ada Check and her spinning wheel of both Sam Daniel and John Foster with the guns he obviously posed. He also posed pictures of Mrs. Jewel Lamberson, barefoot and wearing a bonnet, grinning corn and fetching water with a bucket. This caption for one of these reads, Mrs. Jewel Lamberson, wife of my neighbor who ran the newspaper, posed to show how to make bread and bread. Most of Randolph's photographs appear free from his direct manipulation in the state of view. His pictures, though, are less than He usually took full frontal shots. His subjects knew that he was about to take the picture. This gave him time to arrange the clothing, perhaps change clothes, uh, and to select the objects that would appear within the photograph. After his first two books, the Ozarks and Ozark Mountain Folks, both very broad in their scope. Randolph concentrated on particular aspects of Ozark folk life. His best known works detail uh, songs, legends, beliefs, and stories, for which he got all these particular subjects. In that regard, his work is very typical of that produced by folklorists in the period. In fact, it wasn't until 1949 that the material folk culture study, study the thing, became institutionalized when Don Yoder, Alfred Shoemaker, and William Fry organized the Pennsylvania Dutch Folk Center. Since then, folk life studies have contributed greatly to what Thomas Slarek calls the popular national interest in artifacts. Randolph, ever aware of popular national interests, became very interested in material folk culture in the 1950s. His papers dating from the 1950s, those found in the Special Collections Library at the University of Arkansas, are replete with hundreds of clippings and notes taken from articles and other secondary sources. His notes reflect his interest in what was happening in the 1950s in material culture studies. He copied, for instance, from articles written on material culture in the Journal of American Folklore. 
made a point of familiarizing himself with uh, the new term, material culture, the underlying this great folk art, folk architecture, folk craft, folk industry. Randolph's knowledge of what happened in material folk culture studies in the 1950s prompted him to stress the need for a shift in folklore's attention from oral to material culture. He even called for the development of a pioneer folk and suggested as a model of the Farmers Museum in town, New York. In 1955, Randolph Lobby, the president of the University of Arkansas, in hopes of persuading him to help institute such an outdoor museum, and also an arts and crafts program at the university. He wrote to Francis Church, an old friend, and said, I finally got to talk with President Caldwell about the arts and crafts business. He says he will think about it. At least he ain't again the idea. They're going to set a log cabin, it was originally a schoolhouse, up and restore it, to show the citizens how far we have come from log schoolhouses. What I suggest is that we get two or three more log houses, dwelling, barns, smokehouse, shed, etc., to go with the schoolhouse, with the rail fence around the roof. I lay it on thick about colored photographs of quilts and coverlets. Maybe something will come of it. I'm doing the best I can. Randolph's scheme for an arts and crafts program and outdoor museum at the University of Baylor. The University Art Department deferred, refused to consider the idea, and the university's museum staff did not want collections to use an outdoor museum. In the 1950s, Adrian Randolph received many honors and awards, attended folk festivals, and published several books. His health was failing, though, and by 1960 he suffered greatly from arthritis. He did not undertake much field work. In fact, uh, Robert Cochran, his biographer, said that his days as a collector in the field were almost completely ended. He never pursued material culture studies in the same way he did other aspects of in order to be produced and made work on those art material folk culture. So, what we can see is that Randolph was interested in material uh, culture in the folk arts since the 1930s. Uh, his, his work in oral traditions uh, up until the 1950s was very much in keeping with what other folk lords were doing before 1949. Uh, in the 1950s, when the folklore community began studying uh, artifacts, uh, Randolph joined uh, the group that was interested in the police, but due to failing health and uh, simply not uh, having the resources, uh, most of the physical life closed, he didn't get a chance to do studies in the material culture like he did. Um, and we can see this, um, I think, uh, sadly over the trade in Randolph's work in his, in his photographs, some of which are here. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do now is take a look at, at some of, of the photographs in the and uh, talk about it in various, various ways. Um, This is Randolph in Pineville uh, in the late 20s. Um, quite a bit. Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, how about this over here? Uh, okay. um, quite a dapper fellow. Uh, he had been sick, though, as I mentioned, during the war. And I think he can see the ravages of that illness uh, in his face and frame. Uh, he said of, of this particular house uh, that this, he was happier here 
First of all, I defy you to take a piece of flint corn and grit it with anything besides a stick of dynamite. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, secondly, uh, I don't think Mrs. Lamson went around barefoot uh, too often. Uh, and uh, of course the bonnet was, was an added prop and atmosphere. And the reason I say this is because I, in, in the other photograph, which depicts Mrs. Lamerson on the back of a horse with another man in a very modern hairdo and dress with, and nylon stockings with her, with her dress hiked up to her thigh and Randolph's caption is trying to get a little sex into a hillbilly picture. <laughs> this is the still that Randolph had set up in the backyard. Um, nothing quite so untoward as fraud going on here. Uh, he had an actual moonshine and he set this up. But I think it indicates, uh, first of all, uh, one of those things is Randolph uh, wasn't interested in, in uh, documenting things that he found, and this wasn't uncommon at the time, uh, as they were actually You know, he wanted to get a good picture of the moonshine still. Now, why did he want to do that? Because, you know, first of all, people were interested in moonshine as one of those uh, things that they focused on in Ozark life, in Ozark culture. Again, this is Uncle John Foster, the percussion buzzer loading rifle. Uh, I think it, this, this, by the way, is the furnace piece for you know, one of the first And again, this is what people expected to see. Uh, and what, what do we have here? We have uh, uh, quite blatant uh, overtones of the frontier, uh, subsistence living, hunting, shooting, all sorts of things. <coughs> I would argue that Uncle John probably had fired that gun in quite a while. And here's one that's on the right. This is a, a photograph of, of the corn ritter used by Mrs. Lamberson. And uh, I think this is an example of, of uh, one of Rand Randolph's photographs that, uh, that shows, first of all, uh, his interest in things, and secondly, uh, you know, this is very much a doc documentary program. Nothing, no funny to see, except the nice inclusion of the old wall cat. Oh, is that man? Uh, he doesn't mention it. And I, I don't know. But I'll do it. So that's, a, that's all I have for you tonight. Um, if you have any questions, more than happy to try. One question. Sure. I, uh, you mentioned the uh, cultural inter intervention. I think the sure. term that uh, took place primarily in the southern mountain back later. Why did that not take place in my field? Were there any examples of that? Or, uh, the people that were going down back and then started it. Well, they did here too. I mean, Randolph is an example of someone from the outside. I mean, he yeah, but he didn't organize back no, then like that, and they did in the outside too. People came in and organized them and so they would get money out. Well, uh, and also and they were interested in those. And getting and making any money, but he, he, he was primarily a reporter. He did not like things. Anything he wrote that picture just told about what Randolph began in the other well, that's right. Uh, in that James question about uh, why, I, frankly, I don't know. Uh, I think one thing is, 
in, in Appalachia, most of the people who were doing this were, were middle class uh, women, first of all, and uh, clerics. And there is a theory in Appalachian studies that, that suggests that they went to Appalachia uh, for a variety of reasons. One, to do good works. Uh, secondly, to exercise some kind of uh, control uh, in, in this, because they were locked. They, they couldn't wield any power in the mainstream American life. I don't know if that's a way or a way. Not only that, but there were no uh, exploitable resources, no coal, um, basically coal. A lot of these people who did this were wealthy uh, uh, wives of entrepreneurs. They simply weren't here. That's not to say that there weren't, there weren't resources to be exploited in order to certain common scale in the world. Well, uh, the uh, here of late, I'd say the last twenty or thirty years, I've been aware of the fact that the guilds or the ladies' guilds and churches and things, for example, if they can get to New York, if someone can go to New York to Madison Avenue and take a, a common quilt and show it, for some reason, oh, I think it's agreed now fairly well that we we put uh, we put value on things. Uh, in other words, the thing does not have value necessarily in itself. We put the value on it. Well, if, if that's exposed to people on Madison Avenue, a common knitted quilt, they think it's just a magnificent piece of art. Whereas the people who lived in that area until it was taken out and exposed to those uh, people, uh, they just, and that was just something they covered themselves with and thought nothing about it. Well, yeah. Uh, it was simply a practical thing. Well, of course. Once the Jones decided to go, I do it now if I can make a I'll buy Photographs that are exhibited here, and, uh, and there are quite a few more, are at the Lions Memorial Library at the School of the Ozarks in Ozark, Indiana. And uh, they are available for you, you probably should be in touch with uh, Bob Anderson, who's uh, the director of the library first. And he has the photographs.
interesting point about Dad Randall's second book, uh, those are my quotes, was fictionalized because he made those quotes down in Pineville that he wrote about in his first book very angry. Uh, he changed names and sort of composite, made composites and that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, with all that happens. You know, being back to the river, we crossed that. Yes, they did. Um, this year, of course, we were back to one of the nations he wanted to play for the ball. He was a good one. Yeah, well, that's when I got Max started. Yeah. Huh? Serious play. Yeah. And married it. 